Okay, moving on. Finding the Garden of Eden. We know that Adam, wherever he was created, in a place called Eden, he was moved to a, place, to a garden that was placed eastward within Eden. So, you know, I started to look uh, for the Garden of Eden. You know, we, we see that he's put eastward in Eden. So Eden, you know, a lot of people, we, we say the Garden of Eden, they think that is Eden. No, it's a structure or a, a garden that is placed within the place called Eden. A lot of people, when they try to find Eden, will naturally go to the rivers. They'll try to look up the various rivers and see if they can figure out where the Garden of Eden was. Now, some people argue, well, there's no way we could know because the flood would have messed up everything. And, you know, there's no way we could know because of the damage of the flood. Well, the problem I have with that idea is Moses is writing this about 850 years after the flood. And, um, yeah, uh, it's all written in present tense. You know, the Gihon is the same that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. The name of the third river is the Hittakel, where, you know, goes through the east of Assyria. The fourth is Euphrates. Peace on it says, it is that which compasses the land of Hevala, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, right? So they're talking in a present day tense, you know, so everybody would know, regardless of what the world looked like before the flood, he's saying, hey, where these four rivers are right here, that's where the garden was. So when you look on a map for the rivers, obviously we still have the Euphrates and the Tigris, or, or the Hittichel, up there, and they dump down into right around Kuwait City and the Persian Gulf. There's another, another river, the third one, the Pison, is not a river still in existence today. However, you could go on Google Earth and zoom in and see a very large dry riverbed going across Saudi Arabia. So many believe that that was the Pison. And if that's true, then that's interesting because they all kind of dump into that area right there. So there's good reason why a lot of scholars will point to this area up here as the likely location of the Garden of Eden. Uh, but I think the Gihon throws that whole thing completely out of whack because it says the Gihon compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. Way, way over here, you know, to the southwest of that whole scenario. And Gihon today goes <coughs> under Israel, the Gihon Springs. Solomon was anointed king in the Gihon Springs. They go under the, the land of Israel today. I actually believe that originally it went through the, the land of Israel and connected with the Nile. I believe it originally connected with the Nile, and if that's true, there's a lot of interesting things. Uh, you could go down some interesting paths on that regarding various activity, like Moses being pulled out of the Nile and you know, all kinds of stuff like that. And the Gihon was known as the Waters of Salvation. So a lot of interesting rabbit trails you could go on on that. So the rivers are interesting, but in, to me, the Gihon throws most of the theories out. So is there another way we could figure out where the Garden of Eden was? Yes, I believe Abraham is the, actually the key. And I believe that we can follow Abraham back to the Garden of Eden. I've got uh, two timeline charts here. This is one of them, the Nimrod-Abraham timeline, because they were contemporaries. Nimrod was born in 1908 AM, or a year since creation. And anybody know when Ab Abram was born? 1948 AM, or a year since creation. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, cool, 1948 AM, Abram was born. So see, 1948 AD, Israel. <laughs> Problem is, would you say as a nation, the nation of Israel is honoring the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yes or no? No, when you realize in 1948 AM, the same year Abram was born, Nimrod was made emperor of the world. Oh, now all of a sudden the Rothschild-funded <laughs> activity uh, it, it, that is what we call the land of Israel today with the statue of Nimrod outside the Hebrew University and the um, Freemasonic Israeli Supreme Court with the pyramid and the all-seeing eye and Masonic symbols all over it are rather telling that 1948 AD appears to be more in honor of 1948 AM with the uh, crowning of Nimrod as the king or emperor of the world. Just putting it out there for consideration. In, uh, so I put together this timeline showing uh, their two lives and how they intertwined with each other. When we look in uh, scripture, we see that Nimrod was in the land of Shinar and he had essentially become made king of the world in 1948 AM, a year since creation. This was the same year Abram was born. In fact, Nimrod's evil kingship was a big part of the reason why Yahuwah called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, just south of Babylon, in the first place. In Genesis 11, we see that Terah took Abram his son and the Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his 
son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. Why did they stop in Haran? Well, you realize that uh, the patron god of Ur was a god named Sin. So that's rather interesting uh, in our English understanding of things when we hear the word sin and we think of Abram being called out of sin. <laughs> well, his father was an idol worshiper. Uh, Terah was known for making idols. In fact, he was the chief idol uh, maker for Nimrod. They ran into some trouble uh, w while they were with Nimrod. We see this is backed up also in Joshua 24 too that uh, Terah was among those who served other gods. Joshua tells you point blank, you know, that he built all these gods and stuff. Well, when they ran into trouble with Nimrod, all he did is pick up shop and move to the next town, which was the other place that Sin was the capital, was, was the um, capital city for Sin worship. You had Ur the Chaldees being one in the south and Haran in the north. Both were capital cities that worshiped Sin. So all Terra did was pack up shop from Ur because he was having political problems and moved up to another idol worshiping place that worshiped the same God. But what do we see God telling Abram to do? Leave your father, get out of there, right, and, and take off. Anybody know the story of um, Abram and why God thought he was worthy of being chosen to be called out? What he did with his father's idols? There's a cool story in the book of Joshua where uh, it actually tells you that during the time of the Tower of Babel, um, Abram was hiding out from Nimrod and he spent time living with Noah and Shem for a while. And then he comes back home and he sees his dad worshiping all these idols that he made with his own hands. And, and you know, Abram's thinking all this through. This doesn't make any sense. Why are you guys worshiping this stuff? So he has his mom make up a really nice dinner and everything for the gods, lays them out in front of the idols because, you know, he, presumably the gods will eat it, right? Well, they, they don't eat it. So he gets mad, takes a hatchet, and smashes up all the gods in his father's courtyard. And, yeah, <laughs> smashes them all up. And then he puts the hatchet or whatever he used in the hands of the biggest god. And uh, daddy heard what was going on and came in there flipped out. What are you doing? How did you just, why did you destroy all my gods? What's going on? He goes, I didn't do it. He did. <laughs> Pointed to the big god with the, you know, still had the axe in his hand or whatever. And his dad's like, what are you talking about? This, you know, I can't do it. It's made of stone or wood or whatever. And, and Abram's like, yeah, hello, McFly. What are we doing here? You, know, you made this stuff. Why are you worshiping it? You know, I think God just really saw his heart. That here's a man who's on a legitimate quest for truth, and he just wants to know who the real God is. He spent time with Noah and Shem, and had had enough. And God said, hey, you know what, I can work with this guy. But you're going to have to leave your dad. So we see that he leaves the land of Haran and he, to go to Canaan. But basically God says, start walking, and I'll stop you when you get there. He doesn't really tell him where to go. So when he passes through the land, he gets to the place of Shechem. That's where God stops him. God stops him in Shechem. I'm a visual person, so I love to, you know, put things down. I, I found this map somebody else had done on, um, I just did a Google search. This shows the path that Nimrod, I mean, excuse me, Abram took when he was fleeing from Nimrod, going up through the, the valley there, stopping at Haran, coming down into the land of Canaan, and is stopped in Shechem. Why Shechem? Well, if you do a keyword search on Shechem through your Bible, you're going to find a lot of really cool stuff there. Um, not only did God stop Abram there and say, okay, take a look around. Whatever you see, it's yours. You know, this is promised land. Yay! Um, it's the first plot of land owned by the house of Abraham, right? It was bought for a, a hundred pieces of silver there. It's also where we see that uh, Dinah was raped there by Shechem, the man for whom the city was named. The, the city Shechem was named after the individual who raped Dinah. And of course, we know the story with Simeon and Levi there. When Joseph has the dream, right? They got him in trouble. He has a dream about everybody bowing down before him and all that. Um, after that, uh, his father sends him to go check up on his sons, right? His sons were supposed to be tending the father's sheep in Shechem. The word Shechem means diligence. Well, when he gets there, he finds out that his, that his brothers aren't in Shechem diligently keeping the father's sheep. They went to Dothan. Well, the name Dothan means double sickness. So they went from the place of diligently keeping the father's sheep to the place of st double sickness where they would plot to try to kill their brother. Of course, you know they, they sold him into slavery, right? In the, in the uh, Genesis text, we see that he met a certain man there that told him, no, they went on to, to Dothan. 
but when you read uh, Joshua, it tells you that that certain man was the angel of the Lord. Who's that in the Old Testament? Yeshua. Many believe that Yeshua was showing up as the angel of the Lord in various places. So that's rather interesting, that story, when you think of it in that context. Um, of course, after the Exodus and 40 years wandering in the wilderness, uh, the children of Israel crossed the Jordan. They were told to go to Shechem. This is where it gets really interesting. You know, they spent the 40 years in the wilderness all that, and they're getting ready to come into the land, but you get towards the end of Deuteronomy, he says, okay, when you get in the land, you've got to go to Shechem, divide half the Israelites, put them on Gerizim, and take the other half and put them on Mount Ebal, build an altar to the Lord there, right, and, and inscribe on it the law on it, right, and pronounce the blessings and curses, the blessings on Gerizim and the curses on Mount Ebal. So I, this is where some things started to click for me, and as I was thinking about the implications of that, um, Sheila was listening to a um, teaching by Jim Staley on the Torah portion Re'eh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, R-E-E-H, to see. And I just so happened to hear the part that I'm going to play for you as I was walking by. She was in the kitchen. I just was walking out to go do something. I'm like, what did he just say? Hit rewind. Play that again. Check this out. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 27, it says this. Then Moshe, Moses, and the elders of Israel charged the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you today. So here it is. So it shall be on the day when you cross the Jordan into the land which the Lord God gives you that day, that you shall set up for yourself large stones and coat them with lime. And write on them all the words of this law, okay? And that word law is Torah, okay? Write on the words of this law, the Torah, which means instructions, when you cross over so that you may enter the land which the Lord God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord the God your fathers promised you. So it shall be when you cross the Jordan, you shall set up on Mount Ebal these stones, as I'm commanding you today, and you shall coat them with lime. Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal, right there in the center is the city of ancient Shechem. Okay? This is a narrow passageway. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you the story. What Yahweh said is, He said, I want you to go in, I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant, I want you to take half the tribes, and I want you to stand on half of them on Mount Gerizim, and I want you to take the other half of the tribes, and I want you to stand on Mount Ebal. And he says, I want you to proclaim the blessings. While I'm proclaiming the blessings, I want you, everyone to look to Mount Gerizim. And when you proclaim the curses, I want everyone to look at Mount Ebal. Right in the middle between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim is a natural amphitheater. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's, it's a natural amphitheater. It's a natural like valley. It's kind of off in the distance where the horizon is there. And that's where they stood. Right in the valley so everybody could hear. All, all however many there were. A couple of million people. This is Joshua's altar. This was a spectacular, gorgeous altar. Right here between these two mountains is a derrick at Shechem where God's people were there. And on one side was the blessings. One side was the curses. He's using visuals to get his point across. Joshua builds, builds an altar, uses natural stones. The limestone is put around it for a reason because limestone is malleable. Ma limestone you can write on. It, 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 you understand what I'm saying? It's a soft stone. You can only write on something that's soft. And he wants to write it on a heart of flesh, vellum, limestone. And he says, I want my Torah to be written on your heart. They departed and they went to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan the same exact route as the Israelites are at right now. Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem, I just showed you that. As far as the Teremoth tree of Moray. There it is. So this is the very first, excuse me, very first time that we have someone stopping at the tree of Moray. What happens? The Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to Yahweh who had appeared to him. Are you kidding me? This is 400 years, ladies and gentlemen, before Joshua shows up with the Israelites in this exact same place. Now see, we don't live in the land, so we don't make these connections. But Abraham, that, what, 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 what was the covenant made from? What happened that day? 
Did he give him a can of Pepsi and say, drink, let's pray, you know. What's that? No? What, what happened that day? Something was cut in two. An animal was cut in two, remember? And two halves, and what happened? Abraham was put to sleep. And he went through the middle, did he not? Right here, ladies and gentlemen. There's a reason that Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim are standing the way that they are. Because they are standing as a witness. 400 years later, the altar that Abraham made and the picture. Why do you think that he had half the tribes go on one side and half the tribes go on the other? And the tabernacle, the temple, the Ark of the Covenant is right dead center in between. Because this is the exact place where Yahweh walked between the two halves. Now, I hadn't made that connection, but it filled in a piece of the puzzle of what I was already working on. Because I had seen that uh, in Psalms, uh, Psalm 60, verse 6, and Psalm 108, 7, it says that God divided Shechem. Right? And if you look at Shechem on Google Earth, it looks like it was originally a mountain range that something went through it <laughs> and maybe did a figure eight in the middle of it and carved it out in the shape of you know, something like this where you have this natural amphitheater there. Now, he had taken it from Joshua and, there, and the Israelites are there, but 400 years prior, God had cut the covenant with Abraham there, and I had taken it a step further back than that. I believe that something else took place in the same location. But let's uh, continue with some more bullet points first. The city, uh, one of the city of, of, of refuge was in Shechem, Joshua 21, 21. This is where uh, Joshua gathered all the tribes and elders of Israel and made a covenant with the people at Shechem. The bones of Joseph after the exodus were to be brought up and buried in Shechem. The conversation that Yeshua had with the Samaritan woman at the well took place. Many believe this is a commentary right here saying that this was probably the same location where that happened. Well, there's another connection with Adam and Shechem in the book of Hosea. But like Adam, you broke my covenant and betrayed my trust. And he talks about people being murdered on the road to Shechem. Why are all these connections constantly going back to Shechem? It is my belief, after doing this research, that that location is ground zero in the Garden of Eden. That's where the two trees were. <coughs> that Gerizim represents the location of where the tree of life was, and Ebal represents the location of where the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was. That's where the first covenant was broken. So God brought Abram there and said, okay, let's try it over again. <laughs> I'm gonna, when did he, first time he killed an animal? First time God killed an animal, when? Because of Adam and Eve, right? Right, so he killed an animal there and clothed them, didn't he? Yeah. Then when he cuts the covenant with Abraham, there's another animal, he walks through it, um, and you have the covenant of Abraham, and then you have Israel coming in as a nation from the land, says to stop in the same location, divide half, put the, the blessings on Gerizim, which would have been a blessing if Adam and Eve took of the tree of life first, right? But instead they took of the tree of knowledge, knowledge of good and evil, didn't they? And they were cursed. So you put the curses on Mount Ebal. That's my belief. I think scriptures are telling us through a series of clues and bread crumbs that that's why this location is very important to God. Now, if it is true that Adam was pulled from the Giza Plateau and placed eastward within Eden into a garden, I believe that Adam showed up probably in Jerusalem. I think that's where he ended up and where Eve was pulled from him in Jerusalem. I think some of the things with the crucifixion and all kinds of stuff tied into that may, uh, may give us a, the significance and importance of Jerusalem. But there's clearly some kind of significance going on with Shechem over and over and over again through the Bible. So I believe that you know if they were placed in Jerusalem, they eventually made their way through the garden to Shechem, and that's where everything fell apart. <laughs> that was ground zero. Is there evidence that the land we now call Israel, is there evidence that that is in fact the garden, other than what I've just said? Yeah, I believe there's a number of places that certainly seem to strongly insinuate, at least, that it is. When Ad Abram, uh, Abraham and Lot were traveling together and they were having problems, they had to split up, right? We see in Genesis 13, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan. It was well watered and everywhere uh, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. So there's a comparison right there. Joel chapter 2 talks about blowing a trumpet in Zion, right? Sounding the alarm. And it says the land before them is as the garden of Eden in Joel 2. We also see in the book of Ezekiel talking to the house of Israel 
Uh, it says, I'll put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. Is it the land of the Jews? Is it the land of Israel? Whose land is it? It's God's land. He gives them the privilege of living there, doesn't he? But it's his land. Right. And as you continue reading, this land was desolate, is now become like the Garden of Eden all over again. So I think these are some interesting connections. Also, Isaiah 51, 3, the Lord will comfort Zion and will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the Garden of the Lord. So I think a real good case can be made, and there's others who have put this connection together as well. As I was doing some research on this, I found somebody had created this graphic right here as the, the full borders of the land that was promised to Abraham. I have a problem with this one, though. You'll see that they're following the same logic that I went down, that the Gion probably connected with the uh, Nile at one time, and that the uh, dry riverbed here that is the, probably the Pison, that's what gave them the green area right there that they're calling the, the total land uh, that was promised to them. I would say it's probably more like something like this, because if it was the way it was just depicted, then you have them wandering in the promised land during the time of the Exodus. So I believe that you probably need to draw the line more straight across like that from Giza to the Persian Gulf. This is not the, the promised land and the land above it. <laughs> Regardless, I think you know either the shorter part or the bigger part, that's the Garden of Eden.